Once a year in the sunny California summer, the city of San Diego is transformed from a relaxing beach fantasy and completely loses touch with reality. The hotels are booked, the restaurants are packed, the streets are crowded with tourists. But take a closer look. Those aren't your regular tourists. Those are zombies, ninjas, and villains. But don't worry, you're safe. This is Comic Con. Comic Con, the biggest convention in the world for comics. I'm Natalie Del Conte with CNET. And I'm Daniel Seberg with CBS News. In recent years, Comic Con has also become a huge influence on movies, TV shows, toys, and video games. Some of the biggest directors and movie studios come here to showcase their huge productions. It's like an audition for Hollywood. Exactly, with the more than 126,000 attendees here serving as the ultimate judges of what's cool. Comic-Con used to be just about comics, not anymore. In 40 years, it's turned into the place to feel the pulse of what's cool in entertainment. This ripple effect that comes out of Comic-Con is right. pretty amazing. And the minute something comes up in Comic-Con, it's all over the web. For studios and celebrities, appeasing the people here has become more important than winning traditional reviews. I'm just as much a fan as a celebrity. Considering that they're all congregated in a massive building is a little daunting. <laughs> the fans they're talking about are opinionated and well-connected. And using everything from blogs to Twitter, their buzz can mean make it or break it in Hollywood. I'm a fan of the fans because they keep me in business. <laughs> and it's a big business. Tickets to Comic-Con sold out two months before the event. That's a record. These aren't just fans, they're loyal devotees to this genre. Which one of you have seen Star Wars the most? Too many times to count, honestly. I've seen Empire Strikes Back about, I don't know, a couple thousand at least. That kind of devotion is exactly what studios are banking on, trying to generate hype for upcoming projects. Well, there's a lot of good stuff going on. Director James Cameron chose Comic-Con to show just small snippets from his top secret 3D movie, Avatar. I'm glad he waited for now to be able to release Avatar. It's just with the 3D, it's like things are coming towards you. It's amazing. If you can't get past this group, you're not going to have a greater a, a life in the greater public. Further illustrating today's power of the geek. <laughs> I got to say, I never underestimated the power of the geek. Absolutely. You can see the G on my chest right here. Definitely. All right, well, you know, the comic book has been around in some form or another for more than 75 years, entertaining children and adults alike with compelling stories and colorful artwork. But comics don't just come in book form anymore. Ricardo Torres, the editor-in-chief of GameSpot, shows us how the comic in Comic-Con has jumped off the page and into the entertainment industry. Hey, I'm Ricardo Torres, and I am editor-in-chief of GameSpot, and I'm standing here on the Comic-Con show floor. Now, if you can believe it, Comic-Con started 40 years ago in 1970. Back then, it was like a small gathering of just a handful of people, about 300, that were getting together to connect with the writers and artists that made the comic books that they loved. Now, fast forward to 2009, and you're looking at attendance of 130,000 people with over 1,000 exhibitors. This is what Comic-Con used to look like. Vendors, artists, and fans all coming together to celebrate their love of comics. Now, while comic books are still at the core of Comic-Con, the convention has expanded to include the other forms of popular entertainment that are now influenced by comics. Today, the comic book convention is like a gathering of all forms of entertainment under one roof, and it has grown so from the original Comic-Con. So I'm standing here with David Glanzer, who is spokesperson for Comic-Con. Now, David, do you want to walk us through how much the show's changed? Because it's, it's huge now. It's really massive. Last year we had 126,000 people. And in terms of size and scope, it's just bigger than it's ever been. It pretty much takes over downtown San Diego. What do you think that Comic-Con's popularity says about, you know, for lack of a better word, geek culture? Well, I think, you know, what's happened now is people have embraced this. 
we haven't changed. The people who put on the event are the same people today that we were, you know, 40 years ago. And we're having a great party. The party's always been here. The venue's just getting bigger. Hip hip pizza! Hip hip pizza! Hip hip pizza! Turning the page now, we are joined by Mark Brooks from Marvel Comics, one of the few artists there who in recent years has drawn everyone from Spider-Man to the Hulk to the X-Men characters. You're a busy guy. Very busy. They keep you pretty busy over there. Well, he's agreed to use his powers for good and draw Daniel and me as superheroes. Yeah, I was That's thinking right. maybe some bulging muscles and a cape. Um, pretty much able to fly. Very much like real life. Exactly, okay, I think I can do that. And I would like to be taller and maybe have a really tiny waist, is that okay? Yeah, I think that can be done. So the message you're getting here is that we're very vain. You right. probably figure that out. Yes, uh, but I can accommodate that, you know. I think, I think we're it's, all right. fantasy. it's fantasy, it's exactly. fantasy. Exactly. So do you have some ideas on what we might look like with these uh, characters? Well, from what I understand, you're, you're very much into the uh, the bio kind of thing. Uh, yes, science and technology. There we go, okay. Yep. So. And, and, and it's gadgets, right? Yes, I'm the gadget girl, so I really like the idea of Wonder Woman and her magic accessories that okay. can do things, so anything right. like that. I, I have some stuff in mind. Now, how long is this going to take you? Uh, it'll probably be a couple of hours. Okay. Um, so, yeah. All right, we're going to let you get to work, and throughout the show, we're going to check in on your progress. Okay. For now, we just need to take a short break. And when we come back, we'll give you a sneak peek at some of the TV shows and movies here at Comic-Con. Back in a flash. Welcome back to Comic-Con 2009. At last year's event, movies like Iron Man and The Watchmen generated enormous buzz and became huge box office hits. It's become a real trend here at Comic-Con. Directors showcase snippets from their latest film and hope the internet community gets excited about it. Consider this your backstage pass. So, first of all, a quick question about Comic Con. Mm. Coming here, what these uh, fans are like, what it's like to present something like District 9 here at Comic Con. A little intimidating? Yes, intimidating, a little, a lot. I think anytime you're confronted with you know, several thousand people hanging on your every word and it's just you on a stage trying to sell your idea that came, you came up with in your head to all these people, I think you have to be nervous, I mean. And what do you hope the fans take away from, from District 9? Well, you, uh, you know, what I'm hoping for is it's got character and emotion um, because at the end of the day, any movie has to contain things that affect you somehow and, and so I hope it's thought-provoking and entertaining. One of the big movies that's been talked about here, but not shown a lot, is Avatar. Yeah. Uh, I mean, people have been hearing about that movie for 15 years now. I mean, it's been forever that James Cameron will finish a movie, and the first thing he says is, my next movie's Avatar, my next movie's Avatar. We've been hearing that for years. We always got, like, little snippets of information. Now, finally, it's starting to come together. We actually saw, you know, some footage from the movie. We we're seeing some images now. It's finally coming a little bit to the forefront of what's actually about, but I don't exactly know why he's hiding so much. I mean, it's James Cameron, he's got a lot of fans on his side, so it's it's definitely gonna be a blockbuster, I'm, I'm sure. What's it like as a director to bring Twilight here to this very discerning and influential audience? It's very exciting, actually, uh, because it's something about the Twilight fans, I think, is although oh, they are very discerning and they're terribly loyal to the books, um, so are we, you know, we're, we're quite loyal to the, to the book. And, and also they want us to do well, they want us to succeed. It, essentially it's just about a really simple story. It's just about two people that are dysfunctionally devoted to each other. It's free marketing for them. I mean, these companies spend so much money on marketing when they can come here, show something to a large group of people and then have a thousand champions in one room that are going and saying, this movie's going to be amazing, this movie's going to be amazing. You, they get to tell 20 of their friends and suddenly you have a blockbuster on your hands. Do you yeah, really sure. see that in, in maybe five to ten years we can appreciate a 3D movie without the glasses? Is that possible? Well, not in a movie theater. People associate the glasses with old 3D that had a lot of eye strain and projection problems and things like that. And, uh, you know, that's not the case. All those things have gone away. 3D is, you know, in its glorious kind of renaissance now. 
it does seem like one of the big trends with movies is 3D, but we're seeing it in more places than just films. We've seen it at CES this year, we saw it at E3, the gaming convention, and now here at the comic convention. So it does seem like 3D is the next big thing. The key thing is, it doesn't give you headaches anymore, like those right. old glasses. Well, of course, TV shows also have their own online following, whether it's The Big Bang Theory, Lost, or Dexter. So we checked out the next big thing on the small screen, but not all of it has to do with comics. Tell me about some of the biggest news that came out of Comic-Con for TV. For all the True Blood fans out there, it was an unofficial announcement that it will be back for a season three. Fans of Vampire Anything go crazy, and the True Blood fans, they skew a little older, um, and they were still giggling like little schoolgirls. Comic-Con is such a misnomer. It, like, maybe 30 years ago, it was Comic-Con. It was about comics. But now, all the studios are coming up here. Um, movies have a huge presence, but now it's TV. TV's really taking over. Uh, the, the joke in the industry is they call it TV con now. Big Bang Theory um, last year, it came on for its after its first season, and the the following was pretty big. But this year, it's a whole new level. How is Comic Con going for you? Uh, it's going fantastically well. It's like it's just as um, effusive as last year, and, and uh, but it's like three, four times the crowd. What are some responses that you don't expect from your fans? Um, I don't expect people to sometimes look at us and say, wow, they're like the sexy Big Bang cast. I don't expect to hear that at all, so that's kind of cool to hear, like we're suddenly like sex symbols to the nerd world, you know? Can you tell me a little bit more about the connection between a show like Dexter and uh, Comic-Con? Well, Comic-Con is obviously uh, extended to material beyond comic books or things based on comic books. So that being said, while it's not based on a graphic novel, Dexter has the feel of something that may well have been based on a graphic novel. What are some things that we can expect from next season? Then? We do flash forward. Uh, Dexter's baby has been born. Um, he has uh, purchased a home with Rita and they're living under the same roof for the first time with a whole stew of unanticipated challenges. Since you're playing the bad guy, what are the subtleties of that character? I always approach a, a villain as a character who does not think of himself as a villain. You know, one of the interesting differences between movies and TV shows here at Comic-Con is the movies come in under this veil of secrecy. Nobody knows what to expect, whereas a lot of the TV shows already have this built-in following. And that following is out for blood. I'm surprised at how big vampires are this year. This is true. Well, coming up, we're going to take a first look at some of the gadgets at Comic-Con. Yeah, but before we take a break, we're going to check in with Marvel's Mark Brooks and take a quick look at how he's coming with the latest Dynamic Duo comic. Welcome back to Comic-Con 2009. From Luke Skywalker's lightsaber to Wonder Woman's lasso, accessories are a critical part of doing battle. Now, Natalie, as a editor at CNET.com, one of your main jobs is to review gadgets and technologies. Yes. Did you see anything here on the show floor that you've reviewed at CNET? Not quite. We know actually a lot of the gear here at Comic-Con is a little low-tech. That's right, I found a fellow fangirl to roam the show floor with me and find some toys. We're here with Sophia Tong from GameSpot. Thanks for joining me. Thanks for having me. She's agreed to take me around the show floor and show me about some of the things that we can take home in terms of toys and that kind of thing. Yeah, there's a ton of stuff on the show floor. I've been walking around the last couple of days. And uh, yeah, there's gaming toys, there's some toys from movies, TV. So let's go check it out. This behind us is a huge line. Everyone's waiting for these. Why? Yeah, it's crazy. Well, the 80s are making a comeback because there's a G.I. Joe and Transformer movie out this summer. So uh, yeah, this line's crazy. And they'll take these home and maybe keep them or maybe sell them on eBay. You can sell these on eBay? Yeah. So I don't know about you, but I was a huge My Little Pony fan when I grew up. I was. I had one. She was purple and she was beautiful. Yeah, and uh, here you can get a Comic-Con exclusive pony. It's designed differently and you can't really buy it anywhere else. It's for $16. I can't be without my droid. So 
Oh, he's really cute. What's he about? So he's a T-800 uh, endoskeleton from the movie Terminator. Oh, okay. Yeah, so he's also marked at um, $6,000. They're super deformed plush. Big heads, little bodies. They're very cute, very cute. Especially the uh, Christmas Yoda. I didn't know that Yoda celebrated Christmas. Oh, I guess he does now. Now I know. We've covered a lot here at Comic-Con 2009. The history of the show, TVs, movies. But why do I feel like we're leaving something out? Hmm, yes, I'm thinking maybe the comics themselves. Oh. Now, while comics have a smaller piece of real estate here on the show floor than in years past, their classic appeal has remained almost timeless. Everybody loves things that are bigger than life and that are very imaginary. But these superhero stories are fairy tales for grown-ups in a sense. And they're romantic and they're dramatic and they're bigger than life and they're imaginary and you never know what'll happen next. And I think they're fascinating to people of all ages. How have comic books evolved over the last, say, 10 or 20 years? I think comics have evolved in a lot of different ways. The writing has gotten more sophisticated, so what you see is companies uh, not ignoring continuity, but being a little bit more loose with it and saying, hey, you can come in and read this Spider-Man comic, and it's going to make sense to you, even if you haven't followed Spider-Man for 20 years like a lot of people have. I mean, my, my first comic store was a spinner rack at a drugstore. And I bought my first copy of X-Men, and I was hooked from there. And now you're drawing X-Men. I am. I am. Yeah, in fact, I did, uh, a couple of years ago, I did I did my very first Uncanny X-Men cover. The best comics have to have a compelling story. Absolutely. And they, and they you know, and they have to have a story that, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a little pulpy. It's a little fun, you know. It's like, it's not always going to be this really high-minded, serious thing. It's got to have some action. It's got to have some character drama, you know. Even if I could, you know, just write the, sm the smallest chapter in Star Wars history, it's thrilling. If you had to choose a particular superhero, a particular superpower that you could have personally, what would it be? Well, you're not going to believe this answer. It's not going to be what you expect. Not flying, not nope. uh, strength. The one superpower that I would really want to have would be luck. When we come back, well, it just wouldn't be Comic-Con without the costumes. Yeah, you really have to see them to believe it. But before we go, another look at our alter egos, as imagined by Marvel's Mark Brooks. Welcome back to Comic-Con 2009, a place that makes Halloween look like a dress rehearsal. Every year, attendees wear costumes as a tribute to their favorite character, whether it be from a TV show, movie, comic, or video game. And these aren't the kind of costumes you can just buy at a department store, although you can pick up a Stormtrooper uniform here. That's right. These folks often make them by hand or spend hundreds of dollars to get the look just right. The culmination is the masquerade ball, where everybody gets to strut their stuff. And while no cameras are allowed inside, Sean McGinnis from GameSpot got a chance to chat with the characters before they went inside. I'm Sean McGinnis from GameSpot. We're here at the start of the San Diego Comic-Con Masquerade Ball. Now, if you're anybody, you've got a ticket to this show because it's the single biggest costume event at the convention. So let's go ahead and take a look at some of these folks, talk to them, and see what it takes to get into this event. Kim, do you give us an example of what sort of reactions you've been getting on the show floor? Awesome. And it's so much fun just have people recognize, like, oh, that's the Sailor Moon, and it, it's really <laughs> exhilarating. In this particular costume, how long did it take to make? Oh, off and on, maybe if I went nonstop a month, <laughs> every day, yeah. Oh, yeah? Um, the ears took probably about three hours, and then the tail took like five minutes. Yeah, about six or five <laughs> months, yeah. <laughs> So I've got to ask, Naked Smurf? Nick, come on, man, you're at Comic-Con. Don't you do any research, I'm Dr. Manhattan. So if I was to guess that your costume is Bjork, would, about, would I be right or wrong? That would be wrong. I'm dressed at Kagura from an animation called Speedgrapher. At this point, it's time to get a look at the next big comic book characters to sweep the nation. 
That's right, we have Mark Brooks here from Marvel, and he is going to reveal his creation. We can't wait because we haven't seen it, so we're right, talking about it. Right, been hard at bit. work today. Yes, yes. Um, well, I started off with you, Natalie, um, and uh, I, I saw you as, as our hero. So, um, and, and knowing that you're into technology and things like that, uh, I created the character of uh, Motherboard. <laughs> Wow. <laughs> Her name's Motherboard. Uh huh. That's incredible. Um, She's so, beautiful. Thank you. Um, I, 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 you can go one of two ways. You can go, you know, uh, light and sexy, or uh -huh. you can go kind of dark and mysterious. And so I kind of, I wanted to go dark and mysterious with you. You know, you have the dark hair. Yes. And uh, and and you, and because you're into gadgets, I went with the uh, the, the the gauntlets, the kind of shape changing gauntlets. You know, so you have all your little things that pop out of them. That's right. You know, very and, powerful. Uh, because every every good hero yes. needs a nemesis. Because I'm not an evil villain here. I'm, I'm a good guy. Uh, Is that what you imagine? Uh, I guess you're not. <laughs> you're not a good guy. In this case, in this case, you are the nemesis. And oh, okay. you are uh, Dr. Oh, Bunsen wow. Burner. <laughs> I love you. That's great. So there we go. Uh, so I've got the power of a the fire. The fire, there okay. you go, there yep. you go. Yeah. So and the um, maniacal laugh, which of goes course, with every well, of course. villain. Yeah, you know right? the crazy hair. You know, I figure this is you after a bad morning. You know, <laughs> or after Comic Con. There you go. Yes, there exactly. Go. Well, Mark, thank you so much for for doing this. No I really appreciate it. No it is problem. Thank time you. for us to go leap tall buildings in a single bound. But before we fly off to a galaxy far, far away, we'd like to thank some of the people who helped us with this production. Indeed, we drew upon the resources of GameSpot. We also talked to the folks from MovieTome, TV.com, CBS News, and CNET. For more information, please go to their websites. Now, I'm Daniel Seberg with CBS News. And I'm Natalie Del Conti from CNET. May the force be with you. Or live long and prosper. This coverage of Comic-Con 2009 is a special presentation of CBS television stations.